Welcome to Smart Talk, a series of exciting, often challenging interviews with many economists, most of them well known throughout the world. Allow me to introduce Steve Taft to the audience. Steve has written a book called A True Free Market. Steve has taken some economic concepts, especially from David Ricardo and Henry George, and reconstituted a new economic viewpoint in proposing that people who cannot succeed in the current economy can migrate to underutilized land and in effect survive through networking and teamwork. The resulting interactions, Steve argues, will lead society to a richer and more robust life. We will discuss this idea along with other challenging tenets in Steve's book. I'm Andrew Mazzoni, president of the Henry George School of Social Science, and this is Smart Talk. I want to introduce Steve Taft to the audience. He wrote a book called A True Free Market. But what he has done is he's taken some old economic concepts, essentially from Ricardo and Henry George, and basically saying, in this free market that I'm going to reconstruct, I'm going to eliminate uh, certain factors. For example, unclaimed, unused land, I'm going to use to settle people who can't work in the real economy. I'll put them there so that they can survive there. So he comes from the Wall Street class. And in effect, he's arguing against himself, but maybe not. So Steve, would you just outline the tenets of your system? And then I'll question you on some of them where I feel that needs clarification. But this is a very unique system that theoretically could work. So I wanted you to describe to the audience how it works, what your thoughts were, and we'll go from there. Well, thank you, Andrew. I, I don't see uh, what's in the book is, as being uh, totally unique. Uh, it is based on a land value scheme, a land value tax scheme, which of course comes uh, through Henry George. Uh, however, uh, what was lacking in George to me was how land value tax would actually work in the real world. And there are a couple of areas where I disagreed with George, uh, and we could get into that uh, later if you'd like. But the basic scheme is uh, about taking economics to the level of the human being. And if we're going to talk about a free market, uh, it turns out that freedom is based on being able to say no to any transaction, uh, whether you want to buy a hamburger or uh, rent a video or have a job. You have to be able to say no without that no causing harm to yourself or you're not in a free market. And then to take it a step further, if we're going to have a free market, it really should be people's choice to participate in it or not. So uh, in thinking about what George had uh, laid out with land value tax and thinking about uh, how the rules of an economy are what define human dignity for all of us, really, uh, how could it all work? And as you suggested, Andrew, by taking uh, a land value tax, which causes uh, land to be more efficiently used than it is in current days under current rules, uh, but even in uh, our current rules, we have land that goes unused. So to me, that means the economy doesn't need that land to do uh, its bidding right now. So that land could be put to better use. That better use would be to let people who want to opt out of the competitive economy uh, live there. Of course, where the empty lots are, I'm not talking about an empty lot in the middle of Manhattan and, and putting uh, non-competitive people there. But uh, the efficient use of land would uh, create these areas of unused land which is where the uh, non-competitive people could go. And they could live there off the land without depending on government. So, uh, I mean, people have lived off land since the beginning of people. 
really. So we're not asking anyone to do anything uh, particularly special here. Follow through the, the, uh, the mathematics of doing that. I'll, I wanted to question, question you on, of course, moving people to the unused land, and that's a separate thing we'll talk about. But assuming that that is done, what do you see happening to the economy in terms of employers being able to bargain with their employees, uh, land values uh, in places like uh, Manhattan, uh, would they be affected by the fact that uh, thousands and maybe millions of people would opt out to go to the marginal lands as long as those lands were making a reasonable living? We could argue about whether that's feasible or not, but let's assume that it is. What do you think the ramifications in the, in the economy might be? Well, I think there'd be a lot of ramifications, actually, but all, all of it would filter toward a, a true meritocracy and, and a, a sense of fairness. And uh, when there is a choice in, a, in the capitalism, in other words, it's a truly free market, uh, suddenly it's not a question of winners and losers, but just making a choice. Not everyone uh, would want to work so hard to become a billionaire. Some, you know, artist, for example, might be very content to have a modest living and make their art. Uh, but there would be no uh, uh, pressure or, or stigma from society about people's choices. Now, to answer your question directly, Andrew, uh, uh, people in Manhattan uh, would be the more competitive types, for example. Uh, I mean, to live in a center city, I'm just picking Manhattan because I happen to be sitting here, uh, but the, a center city is, is the natural center of, a, of a, an economic community. You know, the suburbs uh, tend to move out from the center of a city, the economic engine. And so people who, who would live there would either have to be working hard, uh, to afford it, or will have had to have worked hard at some point uh, to be able to afford it, and are living there perhaps in retirement after a successful career. The people who uh, have opted out of the competitive economy would be living further away. Uh, they would not be depending on government, uh, and and you suggested that there might be millions who who choose to do this, well, it wouldn't be an easy life. Uh, living off the land itself, growing your own food, uh, helping each other to build furniture and, and that kind of thing, uh, it's not necessarily an easy life, but what it is is a, a self-directed life and you're not dependent on uh, the larger community, meaning the government, uh, to survive. So, whereas today uh, someone might be forced to take a job to support their loved ones or themselves for that matter, uh, that pressure causes people uh, to take a, a less than living wage in many cases. I mean, we've seen that with uh, Walmart and many large uh, chain hirers who, who uh, pay really less than what people can live on, but those employees are in turn depending on the government to help subsidize their lifestyle uh, with food pro programs and housing programs and the like, uh, which is in effect uh, you know, a form of corporate welfare, not just uh, individual welfare. Well, let's, let's stop right there. Let's take, take the amount of people that might opt for not being squeezed, let's say, in a capitalist vice, for want of a better phrase. I mean, you would literally have millions of people who aren't working now, that that would be their only option or to stay on welfare. Now, for them to opt to go to a, to a marginal site, marginal in terms of it's not gonna be really near any heavy duty center of activity, they're gonna to have to uh, wedge out a living with primitive tools and instruments, they're gonna to have to build houses, all of that would take an enormous amount of capital that the government would have to, in effect, supply. They couldn't do it on, uh, on their own labor. I mean, you're basically taking these people back to a time in, in, in American history where productivity was 40 times less than it is today. So that yes. you'd, have, you'd have a 
truly huge Hooverville a, a, a section of people which could be enticed off that land uh, to, uh, to, to work if, if, if need be, and they'd probably always be subject to, to bids to get them off that, off, off that land from time to time. So whether you could reasonably build that, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure. But if you did, bu you did build that, employers and the rest of the economy would have to bid more for wages for the people that they have because those people could threaten to go offline. So now you exactly have, right. Now and you, that threshold is a living wage. Yes. So no one who, who opted to work for someone else would be paid less than a living that, wage. There's no, there's no question about that. But now you have a, a situation where uh, capitalists or owners of, 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 of capital have to have to bid more for a uh, for a worker, let's say, all well and good, and yet a significant part of the population is not available to buy the output of those capitalist firms as they would then exist in your scheme. So now you have restricted purchasing power on the capitalist side, you have marginal workers on the other side, and you have kind of broken the coercion chain of bargaining power between employer and employee, but you put everybody in a twilight zone. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, there, there's a, a logic to that argument, but even in today's world, which is what the comparison would be, uh, most people can't afford all the products that the economy offers anyway. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't think the effect you're talking about would be that significant. Because uh, when people are poor, they're they're mostly not exclusively, but mostly buying things that that are necessities to live, and uh, they're, they're not buying many luxuries or, or more of the more uh, uh, engineered products in the community. They're buying the basics, so uh, it would really be no different uh, in what I'm suggesting. Uh, that there would be a, a population that would just be focused on taking care of themselves at a basic level. But because the people who are working would have uh, a living wage and, uh, you know, th they would have more purchasing power. You know, I, I, I see the, you know, I, I don't know what the exact numbers are today, but, but uh, you know, if half the United States population is dependent on some government program or another. Uh, you know, that number would disappear. You know, the, the people in China who came off the farms, I think to a great degree, were enticed by uh, the prospect of a new capitalism. China, China uh, in my view, is going through a transition uh, even as we sit here. Uh, and and uh, the, the competitive world is still a rel relatively new thing for the Chinese people. Uh, I don't think there's been, uh, you know, even a, a two generations yet that have experienced it uh, in China. Uh, but to get back to your earlier point, Andrew, uh, about uh, the amount of uh, work that the people on marginal land would be uh, forced to do just to stay even. Well, uh, let me address that by saying this. Uh, any economy that adopted a land value tax scheme would be supplying, as you suggest, the, the, at least the initial housing for the people who lived on the free land, who, who the dropouts, the competitive dropouts. Uh, you know, we supply housing now to poor people. It's not like we don't do that anyway. Uh, so, but, but in, a, in a rich country, that housing would be more substantial than it would be in a poor country. You know, if India adopted this scheme, people might be living in, in tents for all, you know, I can imagine. Uh, you know, now some of them are just living under a, a slant of corrugated metal, you know, in the slums there. Uh, but in a rich country, they might have a very small home, like a trailer home or something like that. Uh, 
basic services could be provided in a country like the United States, uh, electricity, sewage, uh, internet. Uh, uh, and so the, the lifestyle of people who uh, opt out of the competitive market uh, would be a function of the overall wealth of the nation in which they live. Uh, it would vary, but nation by nation. Uh, you know, a rich comp country like the United States uh, could probably afford to make uh, poor people comfort within the realm of, of poverty, if that makes any sense. They might, they might be able to do it uh, much cheaper, but let's, I'll defer that. But let's go follow the uh, logic here. So the, the scheme is in place. Labor costs in the regular economy rise simply because you have to bid more to entice people off this, this land. We're right. not competitive with the rest of the world, so we, now we have to make sure that we don't get free traded to death or else we'll undercut the industry that we have because we're not going to be competitive. And then a smart guy like me sees all of these people in marginal areas, and I get a good idea. I say, let me go and talk to hundreds of these people, offer them machinery, help, uh, all kinds of modernization, if they give me leases on their labor, their marginal property, and I can push them up to a higher level than they are now, and in effect when I do that, I start creating land value on these very, very areas. But you are right, in this sense, when we go back to feudalism, the peasants did have the right to say no. They only worked half a day but the people in charge realized that they couldn't gain the productivity that they wanted to gain, so basically they enclosed the peasants right off that property because the dynamic of capitalism, in effect, the logic of productivity forces that. So that although you've theoretically captured the dignity of man, you fly in the face of historical processes which crush that very quickly. Uh well, it, it perhaps crushed it in the past, but what I'm talking about is reorienting our uh, economic priority. If freedom is going to be the driving force of uh, our economy, then that no, that as I call it, an unfettered no, has to be present throughout the economy. And that, that scheme that you're talking about where some clever person comes in and tries to create, uh, provide capital and create value for the people living in those lands, uh, that simply would not be allowed. Uh, if you're going to live on free land, that means you have chosen to drop out of the competitive market. Right. You can't stay on that land then and then choose to participate in the market. If you're going to participate, you need to go on more higher valued land and start paying okay, rent that, that's like everybody fair. else. You rule it out by, uh, by, uh, by legislation. Let me ask you this. What percentage of people, do you have a vision in your own mind, of uh, a population would be in the, quote, dropout category? I think it would be a very small percentage. I think on the order of 2% or so. Well, uh, in, in terms but, of disutility, I, I find that persuasive. But I also think 2% would not be enough to change the dynamics of bargaining power to any great extent. Well, under the current structure of the economy, I would estimate that close to 30% of the GNP uh, exists in the, in, the, in the form of monopoly profits which relatively few people gain in control. And I won't go through the litany of land, uh, land value, uh, corporate monopoly patents, and so forth. But it's a high percentage and high significance of corporate of, of, of wealth is made through establishment of monopoly. You're proposing to undermine that very monopoly. But I control, as, as that monopolist, I control the laws of the land, the military of the land, the government of the land, the structure of the land, the newspapers of the land, I simply will not allow you to create a, an oasis that undermines the power I have to extract monopoly 
prophets. Now, I'm not saying these people are bad or evil. It's just the way it is. Uh, are you, do you understand the array of institutional forces that would come to play against this proposition of yours? Oh, absolutely. You know, I've, I've, I've felt that, uh, that disdain toward this idea in my life in discussing this book elsewhere. Uh, but uh, I maintain that uh, there are several impacts uh, from having a land value tax and eliminating all others. I don't know if we've said that until this point in this in our conversation that we're eliminating all other taxes. Well, as a land value as a land value guy, is where so so you know where I stand. I I prefer to eliminate income taxes and taxes on profits, sales taxes on all of the taxes in favor of not only a land tax. But in addition to that, a monopoly tax, a monopoly on the creation of money. If I'm a central bank and I can do $3 trillion worth of quantitative easing and I can put it in the banks and the banks don't reinvest it in the real economy, but in effect inflate the capital markets and then they start taking that money and putting it in their pockets through commissions, this is another form of monopoly. As is you know, patents, which we, we, we like to a certain extent, but maybe not totally for as long as we have them. So if you fairly dealt with monopoly, you, I totally agree with you, you could eliminate all of the taxes and have a much fairer uh, economy in the country. And I would argue it's simpler to, to do that and, and pay a citizen's dividend across the board, a baseline, which goes to everybody and everybody understands why they're getting it. They just have to remember to keep it and not let it, let it go to what I call Joe Stalin, the single rent taker in, a, in, a, in an economy. You know, it's one thing to tax land, like in the Soviet Union, give it to Joe Stalin, you've, done, you've accomplished nothing. But if you give it to the citizens, all that you're trying to accomplish gets accomplished almost right like that from that kind of thing. And you eliminate the uh, having to come through a, a structure which moves backward in time, basically approaches a peasant economy, which capitalism in its current form basically breaks down very quickly. Well, you're, I, I, you know, if I hear you right, you're describing something like a basic income? Coming from monopoly, yes. Yes, okay. Well, uh, I spend a good part of the book uh, talking about taxes on capital. Right. Uh, and capital, uh, just to be uh, quick about it, is anything we produce or uh, sell as a service. We, uh, see, we, 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 make. we disagree with that. We say we would not tax anything man-made. We would tax anything not man-made or anything that purports to keep us uh, from full competition with man-made capital. So we would argue. All right, well, okay. All right. So yes, land is not man-made. That's why I'm a proponent of land value tax. Uh, it's The only reason it has value is because of the community that wants Correct. to use it. Okay, uh, everything else, almost everything else. Do you have an idea of how much the land value is worth? How much land is worth in the United States at the present time? Uh, well, estimates vary on that. Uh, the, the cheapest, the lowest estimate I've seen on that was about $6 trillion in, in just raw land, mm -hmm. Xing out uh, national parks. All right, and I've seen estimates go up uh, in excess of ten trillion dollars. Uh, so if you think about, uh, well, I, I will like, give you the, I'll, I'll give you a number which, which I think is pretty close to, to to real. You can pretty much take it to the bank that in a competitive capitalist economy, that land values equal the GNP of that country. For example, if the United States has a sixteen uh, trillion GNP, which it does you could be pretty sure oscillating around the booms and busts cycle of land speculation, the value of land, both improved and unimproved, is about $16 trillion. Okay, so fine. Then, uh, so that makes my point even safer uh, mm. to express because our total government spending on federal, state, local, including health care, right. Uh, spending is uh, around five trillion dollars. It's about three trillion dollars. 
Well, I'm including private health care spending, too. Uh, okay, if you just take government taxes. Government taxes are around three... All right, so the, but the point remains in that land value, whether it's the numbers I used or the numbers you're using uh, on land value or the numbers you or I are using on uh, government spending, uh, there's ample land value there to supply our current needs. And our current needs... Uh, you know, government defined by government spending, and our current needs are bloated a bit because of uh, the way we run our capitalism. No, no I question. Mean, Let me just argue here that uh, the land value component, assuming land earns across the board about six percent return, solid every year, you be you be looking at uh, uh, ten percent of sixteen trillion. Uh, a six percent of sixteen trillion dollars, which would be eight hundred a billion dollars worth of value. The tax, the total tax that the that the government takes in is around three trillion. So the land value tax, if you just took away all the rents, would only cover a third of that. You'd have to go to other sources of monopoly, of which there are many, well, to close that gap. So if if we had a land, this you're taking numbers. Uh, from a, a capital tax capitalism, okay? What I'm uh, advocating is a capitalism that does not tax capital at all. And if land value were established by the free market through auction, which is what I talk about in the book. Well, I, the number I'm giving you is the, is the number, it doesn't show in the GNP counts, but if you do reverse engineering, the number I gave you is the number that this country is paying for in land rents. It doesn't show the GNP accounts. Because All right, but, but the country isn't paying the full value of the rent. If it were, we wouldn't be having this conversation because we, we wouldn't be talking about- We're not uh, collecting it. We're not collecting it, but right, other people are collecting it. it. That's my point. If, if we were collecting uh, the full value of the land, and only that, not the buildings on it. Right. We have ample funds to fund all our community needs uh, that the government uh, needed to fund. We couldn't fund defense. We couldn't fund help. We would be, let me put it this way. If you take all sources of monopoly, uh, all sources of monopoly, you could fund everything and not tax capital and labor. That's pretty clear. Uh, so you can, you, can, you can do that. I'll go over what I see you next. I'll go over the numbers which we have done here to, to, to show you the calculations of that. Uh, so what you propose is doable. I think you do it in a harder way than you need to do it. I totally understand the principle and what you're trying to accomplish. And I think you can do it. But you'd have to know the value of the sources that you could go after and would they affect the workings of the free market? And I don't believe they would. But just to, just so you you have the you have the numbers, the um, if the GNP is is let's say fifteen trillion dollars, then close to five trillion of that is monopoly of some sort. Okay, it's a huge it's a huge number you could cut into, and still have the normal returns on capital, competitive returns, normal returns on interest, uh, competitive wages. Um, all of that. It's just that you wouldn't have this excess build up as a mass to maneuver with by the Wall Street guys who can then hypothecate those of that money, borrow against it, create more money against it, and in effect take that treasure and move around the world buying everything up. So uh, I agree with your spirit. I agree with the spirit of what you're saying. You and I would differ on the numbers, but go ahead. You can challenge me. Well, you know, I, I, I haven't seen the, uh, the math that right. says land value is some percentage of GDP or GNP. It's, a, it's almost 100% of it. For whatever reason, if we've taken tests, countries, cities, states, and it converges to an equivalent of the GDP, and that's because of the structure of the GDP, if you, if you account for competitive uh, returns on real capital, interest, wage rates, and so forth, Rent is a primal. It's, it's, it gets the first draw on wealth. And that first draw 
seems to converge to about 6% of the GNP, but it's a hard number, and it's a number that's the least likely to go away under any conditions. So if that's true, then, uh, and we're collecting the full value of the rent. We were not. We're partial we pal if, if, if in the hypothetical right. economy, we're collecting the full value of the rent, or even part of it, there's more than enough there to collect uh, to fund our community, our economic That's community. True. I would agree with that. Well, I happen to think what you want will happen, but not for the reasons you think. Uh, we live in a finite planet. Uh, we're burning up this planet at a hugely rapid rate. Soon, and whether it's 50 years, 20 years, we'll compromise all of the systems that support life, especially life that's increasing its productivity in a, geographic, in a geometric way, so that we are going to hit a wall that forces us to think of, of uh, propositions like yours, whether anyone likes it or not. That you're gonna to have to come to a steady state situation, and you may have to go to a less robust lifestyle, simply because the planet itself cannot handle untrammeled growth, uh, you know, uh, at, at the rate we're going. If, if we had an open frontiers planet that could accommodate to unlimited growth population, we'd probably be okay, but that's not the case. And so what you propose in one form or another will happen, but it will happen because there'll be more and more have-nots and the people who have will not be able to sustain it in a finite planet and therefore, everyone will have to sit down and negotiate a rational lifestyle consistent with the planet's ability to support it. And well, I, I hope it happens my way and not your way. Okay. But, but, I, but if it happens, we'll be better off either way. That's it for this edition of Smart Talk. For more information on this and past episodes, please go to our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Andrew Rizzoni, and thank you for watching Smart Talk.